Thank you, Sam, for joining us, and Nancy, too, and all of you for joining us for tonight's episode of The Boardroom. I'm Bonnie McEwen with the Northwest District Office, and I'm joined by Nancy Medema, Program Director at the Des Moines office, and Samantha Bowers, who is our Continuing Education Consultant. So the catalog shows us about 50 people registered, which we think is a very good showing. And we're especially tickled to know that there are some libraries that have um, several trustees gathered together in your own local boardroom to watch tonight's webinar. So we're glad to have you with us. Here's where we're headed tonight. Um, this year in the boardroom, and a couple of times last year too, actually, in 2020, we used some books that we use in another webinar series called Big Ideas Book Discussions. It's a nice way for us to get a little more mileage out of those books that we share with our book club readers. And it's just a, it's just a nice way to kind of share some of those thoughts and ideas from all of these um, different nonfiction books that we're reading. So you might remember, those of you maybe joined us last year, we used the book Upstream by Dan Heath. And this year in May, when we were last together, we used the book uh, Inspiring Library Stories. Tonight um, is based on Reimagining Collaboration by Phil Simon. So with a nod to the book, we'll uh, offer you a little bit of tech as it connects with collaboration. But what we really want to talk about and hear about from you are your collaboration success stories. We have some to share, but we know you have some to share with us, too. So that's where we're headed tonight. And just a bit more about the Big Ideas book discussion series. Any of you on library boards are welcome to join us for this. It is daytime programming though, so we know how uh, tricky that can be for those of you who are trustees and you do have other lives and other occupations that you have to tend to. Um, but if you ever are browsing the Iowa Learns catalog and you can see some of the upcoming books that our book club is about to read, these are all done online in a Zoom room just like this. And so you're certainly welcome to join us. We choose books that are um, in the nonfiction genre, they are not typically library specific, but we like to think they have lots of applications to the work that we do in libraries. So in the past, we've used books on leadership and technology, public speaking, workplace relationships, problem solving, which was the book Upstream that we used last year. And tonight we can uh, talk about the ideas from the book Reimagining Collaboration. And here is the book jacket, and here is the book's author. Phil Simon has 11 books to his credit. Reimagining Collaboration is the newest. It was published in January of this year. He is a frequent keynote speaker at conferences. He is a business consultant and trainer and a noted authority on technology and collaboration techniques. And as Nancy and I can attest to, having read this book and done a um, uh, facilitated the discussion on this just last Friday, he is definitely an authority on collaboration techniques with a heavy dose of technology. We're not going to um, be that was techie over my tonight. <laughs> yes, um, some of the chapters were yes up here. <clears throat> but now get a load of this. <clears throat> it was an easy read. And I mentioned yesterday that, um, or last Friday, that any time an author ends every chapter with summaries of his main points, I'm all over that. I love that. That's kind of like being supplied with clip notes. This is especially cool. And I admitted this, <coughs> excuse me, when I showed this slide last Friday, I admitted that I didn't realize that the Four Dummies series was still being published. And I was assured that, yes, it is still being published with plenty of new titles on the scene, like these that also written by Phil Simon, Zoom for Dummies and Slack for Dummies, both published last year. So if your board has, like all of us have at the State Library, really ramped up your use of Zoom, 
in the year of COVID, then maybe we need we need to supply copies all around. Maybe that would be a good purchase for your library if you don't have that. Now, this is a cool story and we wanna take a minute to share this video clip with you because right out of the blue, through the magic of the internet, Phil Simon himself found out that we here in Iowa, we're going to be discussing his book last week and again tonight. So actually, he contacted Samantha Bowers and asked if we would like a personalized video from him. And so to that, Sam quickly said, well, heck yeah. And so he did. He recorded a video clip for us. And so I want to play that. It's quick. It only runs about... Um, only runs about two minutes. So let me go grab that. And you can hear Phil Simon himself. Greeting, Iowa Libraries. Whoops. Hang on. Hello, Iowans. This is Phil Simon, author of, wait for it, Reimagining Collaboration. I want to thank you for choosing my book to read and discuss. It's certainly, I think, a provocative book. And the big idea, as you'll soon learn, revolves around hubs and spokes. So if you think about it, many, if not most people these days are using Slack, Microsoft Teams, Zoom in a very limited way. It really is just the tip of the iceberg. And Microsoft did a study commissioned with, I think it was Beeply, that might be the NFT artist, but something like that, uh, stating that roughly 40% of workers these days feel overwhelmed by the number of technologies and tools that they need to use every day. I'm actually surprised that it's not higher. In any event, part of the reason, in my opinion, is that people look at these tools as separate, when in fact there is a more holistic, more cohesive way of looking at them. This gets into spokes. So just because you use Slack, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, or whatever, doesn't mean that you don't need to use a word processing tool. Right? Doesn't mean that you don't need to use a project management tool. So these different spokes can actually connect very easily to hubs, making for a more cohesive collaboration experience. Now, one other tip that I'll give you, expect resistance as you try to implement this system with folks because remember collaboration is not a single person sport it involves people by definition and folks who are used to email or text messaging uh, might resist the need to change um, it can be incredibly frustrating even with some of my friends i've known for 30 years when i try to get them to use slack they resist and i went to carnegie mellon and we're supposed to be all tech savvy but we are on the right side of history here and all things being equal, organizations and people who embrace the hub-spoke model of collaboration will do better than people who are stuck in the 1990s. I hope that you enjoyed the book. I'd love it if you left an honest review on Amazon and shared it with friends. Happy reading. That was nice of him to do. We don't, we don't get contacted by authors very often for our big ideas, book discussions. No, I would say like maybe never. <laughs> First. Okay, hang on just a second. I'm coming back to you. This right here explains Sam and Nancy why I should buy the book. <laughs> Zoom for dummies. <laughs> Zoom for dummies. Here we go. Here we come. <gasps> well, as he says in his book, if you read it, and I would say it is definitely worth reading it. It is a very uh, quick read. It's it, it, he, he writes well, um, and you kind of zoom right through. The chapters aren't very long. Um, is that he um, emphasizes the need for having a main tool that they just don't get used very well, and that there's all kinds of hidden things within zoom little tips and tricks that so many people don't use and i remember when we started using it which has been many years ago um 
all staff at every staff meeting we had, somebody would come up with a new thing that they learned on how to do something and do it better than what we were doing before. So um, maybe having the dummies books is, is the way to actually go and we'd learn it sooner. I don't know. But I think too, we talked about last Friday, I think another great way to collaborate amongst each other is to share your discoveries that you're making as you're trying out and test driving some of this software for your own purposes, whether it's for your library board purposes or whether your staff has something to share that they think would be cool um, to demonstrate, that's another great aspect of collaboration. And I think learning is more fun when we do collaborative learning. And it's kind of fun to have those aha moments that, wow, I didn't know I could do that. Um, the whole hub and spoke thing too is how we do our delivery system in Iowa. So oh, when right. you started talking about hub and spokes, that's immediately where <laughs> my mind went. Right. Um, so he talks in his little speech about and he in, in the book, he talks about the, the big three, MS Teams, Slack, and Zoom. And I'm curious to know, especially after this past year when we were in the pandemic and stuff, how many of you have used any of these tools? Um, feel free to, I think you can speak up. Um, you should be able to unmute your mics or put in chat. Or if you use something different, um, that's kind of an all-encompassing tool let us know what that is as a board have you used any of these to continue to hold your board meetings or keep your records straight zoom i think zoom really we all should have bought stock in zoom before yeah. the pandemic hit. <laughs> yeah those are just crazy numbers i read an article not long ago about just the usage of zoom since january of 2020 is just crazy webex i saw a webex fly mm -hmm. by Mm -hmm. Oh, and Craig said he attended a board meeting from Wisconsin. Isn't that the, the, the wonder of technology? We can do that now. You don't necessarily have to miss your board meetings. Exactly. And you don't have to kind of steer, steer around the snowbirds or the people who are prospective trustees that would like to join your board, but they're, they're kind of afraid they can't because they're somewhere else for four months during the winter. I mean, this is, this is why these kinds of platforms are so great for board use. Oh, Megan used it for book club meetings. Yep. I heard about that a lot during the pandemic. Somebody said webinar, go to meeting. I've used go to meeting. Um, and Google has a, a Google meet app that if you have a Google suite, you can use the Google Meet app, which is pretty similar. We use that for small staff meetings sometimes when a couple of us get together. Um, what is Slack? Slack is a pretty rich program that allows you to, um, when he talks about hubs and spokes, it's a way to hold a lot of your records together. We used it um, I was on the Friends Board at the Ankeny Public Library, and um, we used it there. We started using it there um, a year or so ago, and it was a place we could put our bylaws, and you could keep track of your donors. So for the Friends Group, that was really important um, because then they could do mailings, and they had all of that information in that one place. So you didn't have to look in multiple different places, which is kind of what he talks about in in this book um, is having everything in one tool um, so that it lessens all the different tools that you have to use. Not that you'll only ever use one. I don't know that Slack has a meeting aspect to it, a public meeting aspect that you can like Zoom, um, but maybe I, I didn't use it that much during that time. We were just kind of starting it. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure it has a live chat feature though. Yes, I believe it does. But think of you'd have so many such fewer uh, passwords you'd have to remember. That's always my challenge. <laughs> so this is another question for the audience. Have you experienced, and especially during the past 18 months, um, some reluctance from your board members on changing things about how the board accesses information or how the board now does business, because I'm guessing that's a little bit different this past year, or has your board pretty easily adapted to the changes asked of them? How have you guys all experienced that? Or any other changes you might have had to do? Were, did you have people who balked um, and really didn't want to 
to learn any of the online ways to hold meetings? Um, did you have people who just took to it and, and offered up their whatever platform it was? I know a lot of libraries um, went out and bought Zoom and it was pretty, it is a pretty cheap tool. Mm -hmm. It's about $15 a month, I think. Per um, user. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and if people balked, I think that's, I think that's human nature. And I'm seeing people have adapted easily. That's what the chat is saying. That's so that great. is really good to know. Um, well, look at evidenced by all of you who are using Zoom tonight and, and logged in and are joining us, not just tonight, but um, in the past. I mean, we've all gotten so familiar with at least this platform, that's for sure. And Stacy said that they're a small group in a small town, so they continued to meet more able to do it socially distance in person. That's great, too. I have to say I missed people while, while we all worked remotely during the pandemic. Um, but, but it sounds like things have been really, really good. And Tammy is on the board at the Ankeny Public Library, which is how I know her. And um, they adopted, but also enjoys meeting in person. And yeah, I don't think you can beat the meeting in person. I think that relationship building happens much more when you're face to face. Um, even though you can see pretty faces on Zoom, it's, it's a little bit more removed. But um, we at the state adopted Google um, couple of years ago now and we do that for our email and for a lot of our record keeping we keep google docs and google sheets and we have google drive where we store everything um, and that's worked really well for us as a staff because we work on teams on different projects and it's a good way to make all of those files really accessible to anybody who needs them and bonnie and i worked with google docs to update the trustee handbook that we um, brought out new in January. Um, and that took us a long time, but that worked between Zoom and Google Docs. Mm -hmm. We were able to work very collaboratively to make that happen. Um, and we had great conversations <laughs> doing that. It was a good process. So I'm glad to hear other people are picking up that too. Well, we'll find out a little bit more in just a minute about maybe some of the other software that you're using. I like this quote from the book. Um, the person who uses the most technology doesn't win. Still, we need different applications. So in case you've ever found yourself saying there is no earthly reason why I have to know <laughs> this techie stuff, haven't we all said that a day or two in our lives? I don't and I don't think ageism has anything to do with it. I think it's the pace of change that leads us to say there is no earthly reason why I have to learn another tech tool. Well, yes and no. Um, Phil Simon says, Simon, Simon says, get it? Phil Simon says, um, you don't, you don't have to know it all. Um, you don't have to use it all, but you do have to use some of it. And here's why. Um, I thought chapter six of the book was one of my favorites because it was very instructive. It laid out a chart similar to this, showing various tech products that are out there, um, showing what they can do to improve our personal lives and our work lives. So, there, there are several mentioned here on the, on the slides, and I think my takeaway from this chapter is while some people might prefer Prezi over PowerPoint, regardless, you need to use some kind of slide design software for presentations like this. Um, some people might prefer Dashlane over LastPass, but regardless, you can hugely benefit from using password management software. That's what LastPass does for you. It's password management. 
So to all of you, we've we've asked about your use of Google or maybe Microsoft Teams or Slack or other things. As you look at this list of categories and some of the possible products within them, is is there software here that you see on screen that you're using or other applications that you're using? I will pipe in and say any library who just applied and got an ARPA grant is using DocuSign. Oh yeah, that was a new that was a new wrinkle. That was new for everybody and everybody took to it pretty well, including us, right? Including yes. still a library it's still a learning curve. Managers, okay. that was a learning curve for sure. What are you seeing from this? Well, I'm listing? seeing some alternatives that the oh, Mac yeah. has. So yes, oh, some, for sure. some names might be different for the Mac yes. um, or Apple products. Um, <laughs> Sam always jokes that her password manager saved a lot of money on marriage counseling. <laughs> My, I, I my pass, I, no kidding. My password manager saves my bacon like every other day. I often thought if I had to use just one of these, and I know I can't use just one, but the one it would be really hard to live without is LastPass. That's the one I use for password management. And you only have to know one login and password, you guys, and it opens up what they call a vault of all of the other programs that you're using that require a login and password. It's and an you, ingenious idea, whoever thought of that. Yes, because you cannot use the same password for everything. And here oh. we have to change our passwords periodically. About I'm already getting every, notices that I have yeah. to change it again. About um, every 60 days, a state government says. So I'm seeing LastPass, Google Docs, Facebook, social media for doing a lot of um, advertising and programming. A lot of people did Facebook Live. So that's been really popular. Yes. Weebly. Um, did I say Dropbox? Canva. Oh, Canva, uh, yes. Concrete 5. That's what our websites here are at the State Library. That's the program we put out there. Um, Teams, DocuSign, Microsoft Office, 1Pass, I've, or 1Password. I think I've heard of that before. Um, <laughs> and a whole, a, a notebook. I, I do that too is where my passwords actually go. Though, my iPad will save them and it uses my fingerprint to unlock, which I like that too. Um, that's been kind of nice. So, well, you're all tech savvy. We can tell that just Acrobat. by, yes, just by what you're sharing here. Well, where we want to kind of take our discussion now is, um, is in a little bit different direction because before we layer in too many technology tools like the Google Suite or Zoom or all of those that you just looked at on screen and you just mentioned that you're already using, before we layer up too much technology to this collaboration idea, I think we first um, have to build up some serious human relationships. Um, I love these two quotes. Um, the fun for me in collaboration is that working with other people just makes you smarter. That's proven. That's from the guy who brought us Hamilton, right? And the second quote from Simon Sinek, a team is not a group of people who work together. A team is a group of people who trust each other. So we need those relationships with colleagues, with, with other trustees, with our city partners, with other community partners. Um, how about with the state library? You need some collaboration going on there too. It's all what Dr. Phil calls relationship management. So people need to come together first to establish that trust and to establish some consistent communication, which leads us into some examples that we want to share with you of people to people collaboration. And I moved my things way too fast. Um, so what, you know, looking at this list, look at who your um, collaborative partners might be. And 
you know, think about what some of those collaborations, you'll have a chance to talk about this a little bit later when we go into breakout rooms, but this is kind of to get you thinking about some of those different groups that you might collaborate with. Based on what Bonnie just said with um, Simon Sinek saying about teams or people who trust each other, I'm guessing that doesn't apply to high school homework teams. That <laughs> One person usually does all the work and the other slack off. But, um, but I will say that the people you work with, you build that trust over time. And the more you have that trust, I totally agree with him, the better collaboration you have working as a group. And I see that every day here. So... Well, we you know, have examples. It is oh, people. excuse me. That's okay. Yeah. It is people that, that matter first before the yeah. technology ever comes into the picture. Right. Um, and when we have that trust and that, and that, um, that friendship or collegial feeling, I think then it's easier to accept um, changes that might be techie based, right? And it's easier to maybe um, share those discoveries that we're making in the software that we want to start using. Um, because you know you have friends amongst you and uh, there are no dumb questions and you can all learn it together. So we have some examples of all of these kinds of people to people collaborations. So as you listen to these examples, be thinking of your own that you want to share with us because we want to hear from you. As Nancy said, we're headed into breakout rooms um, coming up. But first, we thought we would share some good stories that we've gathered around library land. And here's the first one. This is such a nice example of collaboration between a city library and its city council. This comes to us from Sioux City where every September, the Sioux City Public Library Board and the City Council come together in an annual joint meeting. With the library hosting, which is what I like about this too, because this happens on the library's turf. So how many times have you heard it said that City Council people are not that frequent? Um, a visitor to the library. Um, this happens on the library turf. This happens in the main library downtown in the meeting room. And amongst, uh, among other things, the library shares its annual report. It's a great opportunity for other kinds of information sharing. Um, made especially helpful with all of those other players in attendance. Look who else um, tends to come. The city manager, the city clerk, city legal, and the library's leadership team. So throw in lunch and you've got yourself uh, a pretty good uh, collaborative meeting there. And I think this, this approach should look pretty easy to replicate. It's certainly inexpensive. I think it's a great building block in your communication and in your relationship building with your city partners. Maybe some of you uh, in the audience tonight are doing this. And if so, just chime in to chat and let us know if you're doing something similar to what Sioux City Public Library is doing. It's been very effective for them. And because I referenced the fact that um, they share the library's annual report, I wanted to share with you a screenshot of Sioux City Library's annual report. This is actually um, four pages total, and we have shared this document inside Iowa Learns as a handout. So you directors out there or anyone out there who has an Iowa Learns account, you can find this as a handout in there and you can print it and share it with your trustees who might not be able to access it that way. Um, this is from the annual report from um, fiscal fiscal year 20, I think. And um, page three actually explains what the library provided throughout the year of COVID. So it's just a, it's just a very flashy, snappy looking report to share with all kinds of audiences. Here's a nice example of a collaboration between a city library and community partners. Now, this story comes to us from the May issue of Cityscape Magazine, which is, if you're not familiar with that, Cityscape Magazine is a publication from the Iowa League of Cities. 
And libraries are one of many city services, of course, but anytime we see an Iowa library that's featured in Cityscape Magazine, we take note. And this article from back in May features Elma Public Library. It's a story about all of the good that comes from community building and community connections. This is all about relationships and partnerships. Because in a population of 550, the town of Elma has made amazing progress in renovating and revitalizing city services, including they're building a community complex that will house the city library, the city hall, and a community center. And there's even a daycare, um, a daycare service that is adjacent, I think. I'm, I don't think it's in the same building under the same roof, but it's certainly adjacent. So all of this will be, will be um, you know, together in, in, a, in a complex. And this is just a really, I think, inspiring story. We shared this in the boardroom episode in May, and we wanted to bring it back to you again tonight in case you'd like to read more about it. This article also you will find inside Iowa Learns as a handout. Here's a nice collaboration between a library board and its friends group. If you're not familiar with this website, this is a really important website to turn to. Even if you don't have a friends group, United for Libraries is a really wonderful and rich resource of materials for all of you who serve on public library boards. United for Libraries is a division of ALA, and it's a division that's expressly intended for library board members, for friends groups, foundations, and for advocates of all stripes. Um, some of their material is freely available, free to download, but there's other material on their site that is behind a paywall, and it's only accessible through a, a membership into United for Libraries. But what's especially handy about, about this website is to help you decipher which resources are which, which ones are free and which ones you might have to pay or get a membership fee in order to access. There's a link to an Excel spreadsheet that lays it all out, that shows exactly which resources are free and which ones are not. So if you're curious, membership in United for Libraries, um, you'll first need an ALA membership actually. And then to that, you tack on um, the divisional membership. If you're springing for both of those, it'll be around $125. So not inexpensive, not maybe not hugely out of line. But um, certainly, even if you don't spring for a membership, there's certainly lots of good resources that you can find for yourselves as trustees and for your friends or foundations people. Now, here's a resource that I found on the site that's totally free. Um, this document is just one of those free examples and also a good example of being able to strengthen the communication between the library board and the friends group. So it really is a great aid in communication, but it's also a great aid in building a really critical understanding of the roles and responsibilities of library board members versus friends groups. What I've found in my experience in working with libraries is whenever there's a source of creative tension between the board and the friends group, it's quite often because they've lost sight of each of their roles and they've lost sight of their responsibilities. So collaboration um, you can you can layer up the technology, certainly, but it really has to be, I think, the underpinning of collaboration has to be good communication. And this is a really nice example of communication between both groups, which really is essential to a successful friends group. And I believe this is another handout that we have uploaded, or I will say Sam has uploaded for you inside Iowa Learns. So easy to get your hands on it because it's hard to read. That was a lot of words for, yes. for a slide, but a lot of good information. 
So another Phil Simon saying is when people use collaboration tools, they spend far less time looking for key documents and the savings add up. Time is money and we all know that. Um, and that was kind of what we used Slack for. That's what Slack is really good for is holding those key documents in one location. And again, like I talked about with our staff, having them in Google um, and knowing that you can get to them and being able to organize them nicely is also very, very helpful. So he, Phil Simon had some sage advice that um, really rings true. One thing he does talk about too is why email is not as useful as so many people think it might be. Um, and for these reasons, it wasn't design, designed for collaboration. It was really just designed as a very basic communication tool. And people have tried to transform it into some sort of a collaboration tool, which becomes extremely frustrating for everyone who gets on that group email list or that group text, if you're using texting for that too. Um, it fails to capture organizational knowledge. Most email programs disappear after a period of time. I know ours at the state do. After six months, those email messages start to disappear. And if you haven't um, pretty much copied them into something else, they're very difficult to hold on to and save and usually have some important information that becomes necessary to hold on to. And Nancy, I would I would just add that that becomes really clear um, when people leave the library, yes. when, when people leave the library employment, um, they really should no longer have access to their work materials. Um, and so there goes, there goes the um, that organizational knowledge again. And another really good reason to have some way to keep your passwords so that there's mm -hmm. some consistency in them after that person leaves and they don't, you know, they're not there to ask. Um, it provides only one bite at the apple when you're talking about collaboration. It's a very, very small piece. Um, it lacks critical context. And if you've ever communicated via email, you, you can't read tone, you can't always read exactly what they want. Um, I know I have that issue with somebody over at the Department of Ed. They're very short and curt in their emails and it comes across as a little bit rude. Um, but when you talk on the phone to this person and ask the exact same question, you get much better information um, because you can read that tone. You can um, ask questions, you know, immediately there's not that waiting for somebody to read that email response at a later time. So it's, emails are not a timely tool um and email but it's notifications deceptive. but it's deceptive too i think because people kind of think about email as being this instant it's not like instant messaging or no. instant chatting or texting but people kind of have have equated it that way and they think that by sending an email um you know the person on the other end can answer it immediately and it's just not designed that way yeah, it, again, it was designed for communication, not for collaboration. So if you're trying to get information or share ideas or have a group thing going, it really, um, I know when I look at my email list, I pick and choose which ones need to be looked at first because again, time is money and, and you know, I, yeah, I get a lot of them. Um, I will say too, I, I think about emails the same way I think about a phone. It does not have a constitutional right to be answered. Um, and, and I think about that with my emails. It can wait. You know, it does not demand my time right this moment, which makes it not the best tool for collaboration. So think about that the next time you write a group email. <laughs> Not that they don't have their place. For information, if you're just passing on information, email is great. Um, but then you still have to figure out a way to save it if that's needed. But anytime she sees in the sender line, Bonnie or Samantha. I, I answer it immediately, yes. Just like that. <laughs> She's on it. Just as, like as you are when you see it come from me. <laughs> yes. Oh, of course. It goes the other way, too. Of course. And we're right on it. I have enough people on this call that know my email habits. I should probably stay muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, well, we will continue to use it, though, to some extent. It's necessary. It's really it really is a necessary part of of the business world. And maybe that maybe there is some generational differences there. I won't I won't argue with that. Um, The younger crowd is not not so much into email. Oh, no, I don't think my and my son isn't that young anymore. I don't think he he rarely looks he looks at email when he's job hunting and that's about the only time (laughs) so that is not how I communicate with him so we want to circle back a little bit um, to add some technology back in I think we've made the point that building those human relationships is extremely important and I don't think anybody on this call or on this webinar will doubt that because we all prefer to meet in person we all prefer to go into the library in person and, and conduct our business in person that's that's how we're wired um, but technology, as we've learned this last year, comes in very handy when you need it to. Um, so I don't think we have time to play this video, do we, Bonnie? No, I, I don't think we do. Um, we're at the point where we want to um, try a, the breakout session feature, so uh, the breakout room feature. But it's, it's a great video clip for you guys um, to take a look at at, at your leisure. And you will get a copy of the slides, so you'll be able to access this link um, from the slides. This is a a collaboration of county libraries up in, is it Sioux County? It is. Yes, it's Sioux County. County. Um, Mm -hmm. With um, Sioux Center and um, Amanda Vasquez used to be at the Orange City Public Library and is now at Dubuque County Library. And so they had built a working relationship because they were right down the street from each other kind of, um, 20 miles, you know, it's right down the street when you're up in Northwest Iowa and, um, and had worked well together many, many times. And so they did many collaborations, um, from that. So this is, um, they talk about how that collaboration works during this video clip. So check it out after we're done today and you get a hold of the slides because I think it'll be worth it to you. Yeah, and it's and it's not just internally how so center staff uses it. It's also on a broader scale how the libraries in Sioux County use it. But even on a cooler scale, it's how the Sioux Center Library Board uses it. The library board uses OneDrive to park their board documents there. So there's a really nice demonstration of how it works. If you're in the market for um, some kind of a techie approach to your board uh, documentation and to retrieving it a bit easier than through email attachments, um, you'll like this video clip. And we in libraries are all about taking good ideas from others who have developed them already and sharing them. (laughs) As ask your library director or your youth services person, because that happens every day. Um, We just, we know to do that. It's not stealing, it's borrowing and sharing. It is. It's collaboration. It's collaboration. Exactly. It's collaboration. So now we're going to break, um, move into some breakout rooms. And we want you to, we're going to kind of go back to that question I asked you earlier to be thinking about what does collaboration look like with your city partners, with other city services, if you have a friends group among the libraries in your county. And I will say we do have some counties with only one library in them. Um, Unfortunately for them, it's harder to collaborate a little bit. You have to go a little bit farther. And what about the techie applications? So you don't have to ask in your group, all of these, but kind of focus on one and try to share what you do um, within your libraries, your trustee group, your friends group, whatever. Um, And and we're going to ask you to report back too. So Sam is going to do her magic. Sam, I need to stop sharing at this point. True. Or false. It, it doesn't True. matter too much uh, either no, way, but you can, certainly, you can certainly stop. I I'll will stop. say that I believe because you are the host, I cannot oh. put you in a room, but when I, when I open the rooms, would you please join room two? I will label it Bonnie's room and I will join room three. <laughs> okay. And she's going to toss us. Room one. She's going to toss us into your room. So be ready. Yeah. So the way that this works, if folks aren't familiar, is Zoom lets us move into some smaller group discussion sections. So um, those of you who have been around state library programming for a while may have used these, and I think it'll go pretty slick. Um, I'm going to 
open up some breakout rooms. Uh, you'll be with a group of 12 to 13 other Zoom participants. Um, some folks, like I can see on the screen, the Hospice Public Library, for example, you guys count as one participant because you're signed into Zoom just once, but um, we'll go answer these questions in small groups and we will have uh, someone from each group report back. So if you would like to be the leader, be preparing mentally to volunteer when we get into our into our classrooms, all right? So Bonnie, you're headed into the room labeled Bonnie's room and I will go into the room labeled Sam's room and we'll see you all back here in 10 minutes. Is that correct, Bon? Yeah, I think so. 10, 12, all right. something like that. Well, I'll say 11. Then 11, we exactly, 11 minutes. Exactly the average. All right, we'll see you guys and we'll be back here soon. All right, as you come back into this space, you are muted again. So if you came back, um, if you did, we're talking in your breakout room, now you are back on mute. And sorry, Steve got, it got cut off right in the middle. I'm sure oh. he wasn't the only one. <coughs> All right, what did we end up with? Um, Sam, did we have three rooms? We did, yep. We had three rooms with about 11, 11 12 people each. Well, are we ready to hear these, these great collaboration stories that you all shared? I think so. Who was room number one? I was room number one, and I did not ask somebody to be our, our recorder. I, just I did, but I got no takers, so I did. Didn't <laughs> I, I just started forgot. taking notes. So, yeah. man, I guess that's how persuasive. Really... That's how persuasive I was. So I ended up taking notes, but that's okay. I have a I have a good idea, you guys. Um, Nancy and Sam, I had a good idea about this. Um, it would be cool if we all kind of compared our notes and compiled it somehow, like in a I don't know, in a Word doc or no, no, wait. What if we put it up in something like, oh, I don't know, uh, a collaboration tool. Yeah. Think of one. Yeah. Like we could throw it into Google Drive and make it a commentable document. Everyone can add their comments. You can Lots send an options. email. We could send an email <laughs> and just have you reply all with great ideas. Well, um, we you could did not listen to that. a thing I said. Well, we could. And, and you notice that my first reaction was, not unlike yours, my first reaction was, we could put it in a Word doc and we could, <laughs> we could send it to people or not, or we could use a different method. We'll think on that and don't be holding your breath because um, this gal is going on vacation on Sunday. And so this won't happen anytime soon, but we'll think about it. We'll get some. I digress. Out. You go ahead, Oops. Nancy. Oh, now the lights went out here. So yeah, I was going to say the lights all of a shut sudden off it got at dark seven, I think. Um, huh. I thought it was much earlier. Oh, well, I hope I can read my notes now. So we talked about, lot, we had a lot of discussion going on in ours or kind of reporting out. Um, Van Horn does a lot of county meetings um, with librarians. So the librarians all get together. Sioux County does the same, but they do a fall board meeting where um, the librarians come, the board members come, state reps and senators come, the county supervisors. Um, and this last year, they did have to do it over Zoom, which wasn't as productive, but um, they did get some representatives and stuff to show up that might not have made the trip up to Northwest Iowa. Um, so county, more, um, county meetings um, with and without boards are really, really popular and have been uh, all over the um, group. Um, Forest City has been collaborating with Rotary. They're in the process of redoing an old grocery store and making it into their library. I was lucky enough to tour it before any work started. So now I'm excited to go back afterwards. Um, and they, um, the Rotary is collaborating with them and they're fundraising and is matching um, money that is donated. So that's nice. I think she said up to $50,000. I could be wrong on that. Um, Bondurant, um, Bondurant, Davenport, and I want to say somebody else have liaisons from um, their board that go to city council mm -hmm. meetings and vice versa, um, so that that helps keep those methods of communication open and ideas flowing. I thought that was a really smart idea. Um, Charles City 
did a fun, their youth services librarian this year did a really fun collaboration with their Parks and Rec, where they did Where in the World is Miss Stacy? And they had clues and stuff all over the community. And so it was a good way to get um, people out of the library and around the community and interacting with different businesses and parks and that kind of thing. And then Davenport does a um, party in the parks where each of the departments get to showcase what they do. Um, and again, gets people out and about in the community. So some really good ideas um, that our group came up with. Let's see if you guys can top that. Well, maybe we can, but it was kind of dependent on how fast I could scribble my notes. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, so we learned in Wall Lake that the SAC County Conservation office was looking for letters of support for the conservation department's efforts. The Wall Lake Public Library provided a letter of support. The Sac County Conservation Office wrote some grants, got their grants, and in repayment to the library, they offered some programming at the library. So that was kind of an unexpected bonus win. Um, at Ankeny Library, which has a brand new building, which I'm anxious to see. I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. It sounds beautiful. Um, their children's services people is. <laughs> join the farmer's market uh, to present story times. And they have a friends group as well at Ankeny. Um, Villisca partners with their elementary school in that they will hold, the library staff will um, do a uh, reading um, to classes weekly and they were doing that in person but then in the year of COVID they started doing um, weekly readings to class groups um, via Zoom so I loved that story and in Lakota um, there was a great story told there Carrie shared that um, a great collaboration between the library and another city service and that being the police department it all started in their parking lot because the two buildings um, share a, a common parking lot and so they've done some really nice programming collaborations with the police department including um, National Night Out so that was our group I'm just looking at my notes really exciting. I didn't take very good notes on which cities or counties were doing these things. So um, folks Pick in up my in group, the chat, if it's you. Yeah, folks in my group are going to have to um, chime in. One in particular I liked, I believe this one was from John Henry. And John, I don't know which library you're at, um, mentioned that they collaborate a lot um, with their friends group to trial different uh, databases. So the friends group might front the money for a year for, diff for different databases. And then if it, the usage works out, uh, you know, they're, then they're able to subscribe uh, for to the, you know, build it into their regular budget then the next year. But that's just a great way to maybe that one. try something you wouldn't normally do um, and see and see if it works out. And I, I especially love um, kind of the the trial and error that that is like just because we did this for one year doesn't mean we have to do it all the time but that we're we're just trying it out we're gonna um you know throw the spaghetti at the wall kind of thing um we also had a lot of county-wide stuff you know county-wide board meetings that kind of thing another library went in with the whole county to do um grants uh for their summer programming so that all i think it was four libraries in the county can put in for one grant um, and try and book the same performer on the same day um, for, for funding for the summer programming. Um, in, uh, let's see, town near Harlan, I can remember the Harlan part because that's where my best friend is from. Uh, Calla, where are you from? Let me look at your name again. Oops, um, Calla's from Elkhorn. Um, they uh, did not have summer food service uh, in their smaller town, um, but Harlan was getting summer food service. And so partnering uh, with the library in Harlan and um, the summer food service people, they were able to have a snack offered three days a week at the library, which they could also do in conjunction with the farmer's market and all the other summer programming that was going on. So um, we talked about ISU extension and shelter 
services near Ames. Um, so again, just a lot of a lot of really cool things. I'm always so encouraged after a, a talk, talk like that. Wow, really cool ideas, you guys. Yeah. I know we have, when yeah. we've done grant programs from the State Library in the past, we've encouraged um, different libraries within a county to to collaborate together in order to get more money. Um, so, and we've had takers on that. There've been some good ones in the past. I can't remember what specifically they were because they were this latest round of grants we did. They were a couple of years ago, but um, wow, there are some great ideas. Um, there's one in the chat too. And I don't know if it was a, a breakout room, possibly um, <clears throat> that, and John, I don't know where you were from, but they do uh, Latino a Latino festival. festival. That That's Orange City Library Service. Oh, is it? Okay. Um, I should have known by the last name. Sorry. <laughs> that was a clue. Um, that I think that's a cool way to do it too. Mm -hmm. What a fun, what a fun, as a, as a library worker, what a fun thing to participate in um, and reach parts of your community you might not reach otherwise. So um, good job, you guys. Well, I coined this phrase. I like to think I did anyway. I coined this phrase not long ago. Your stories lead into my storytelling. So that's why we love to hear these examples from you so that we are able to share these kinds of examples all across the state. Um, anytime we do uh, programming, just not just in Northwest, but anytime we do programming like this, these stories can spread far and wide then and can really, I think, inspire other libraries who haven't yet thought of that idea. There comes the inspiration. So thank you for indulging us in these breakout rooms. We have a few more wrap up slides to share with you and two shameless commercial messages before we sign off. So let me bring back the slides. Got to love state library commercial messages. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for participating, everybody. It's always nice to hear from you guys and not be the only ones talking through these. <laughs> we love to hear ideas from libraries. All right. As we wrap things up. So after we've talked tonight about collaboration, both with people and with technology, how do you see yourself approaching collaboration moving forward? And, you know, are you thinking about some new partnerships? Did you hear something tonight from another library that might make you think, huh, that might be something we really want to do? Um, I hope so. I hope you took some good ideas away. And this is just food for thought. You don't have to respond. Um, it's just to get you thinking about what we talked about and how you might utilize that uh, moving forward. So just kind of keep that in your mind as we finish up here tonight and you go back to your board meetings and your <clears throat> libraries. Go check your library catalog. You can probably do that online from the comfort of home. And see if your library owns the book, Reimagining Collaboration. Oh, it is a new one. If they don't, you might suggest they buy it. Yeah, it came out in it just this year, I think January, maybe, of 21. Um, I kind of sort of think it's also in Bridges. I meant to look that up. Um, but if this sounds like a book you'd like to pick up, it is really, it's really an easy read. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty tech savvy, of course. Why wouldn't it be? I mean, Phil Simon is a noted collaboration and technology author, um, but it's a pretty easy read. Uh, and the Cliff Notes aspect is pretty cool. All right. Here's Definitely our first. Definitely helpful when you're trying to get through a book for a book discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Minor technicality. Um, but what I liked about it, you know, is that it kind of helps really kind of synthesize why we use all of these dis, um, all of these um, software programs. And as he said to us in his uh, customized video for us this evening, um, oftentimes the reason people feel so overwhelmed by so much technology coming at us is because it's it's disconnected. We don't, we don't really connect the dots and, and discover why we're using this. And it's probably in the, in the launch of programs 
um, there has to be the why. The why behind why we're changing to something or using a new software product has to be really, really well communicated to staff and then and then to boards as well. So start with why, right? Which takes Nancy. us back to another book we used um, for, I believe we did a trustee one with that yes, one, Start With did. Why by Simon Sinek. Start Great with book why. to read. Yep. Yeah, but I think that's what this book does so well. It kind of lays it out there in terms of it's very instructive in terms of why we use the software that we use. And if we're not using it, how beneficial it would be if we did. And and how you can use what you're using to a fuller extent. That's what I got a lot of. Yes, exactly. To greater advantage. They have a lot of each program has a lot more depth to it than most people realize or use. And um, you might be able to slim down some of that technology if you were a little more informed about what the tools were that you were actually using and what they could actually do for you. So so we'd love to hear from you if, if you like this approach of us bringing in, occasionally bringing in some of the books that we use in our online book club called Big Ideas, Book Discussions. If you like this, um, let us know that because I think it's an I think it's a nice way to for us to get more mileage out of those books and um, a nice way to acquaint people with some of those some of those concepts too as we as we try to apply it to the business of boards. And it always amazes me how a book that is really other than inspiring library stories, none of them are geared around libraries, but how we can tie them to the work we do or the work boards do. Um, there's always some tie-in. It's kind of like church. We see movies all the time that you wouldn't think have a religious bent to them, but every single one of them can be tied. <laughs> but Well, if you're ready for our first commercial message, Nancy has it for you. And if only we could have some kind of a virtual drum roll, this we'd be very excited about. Are you ready? Oh, sure. And I lose my mouse. Talk about anticlimactic. And I lose my mouse and I lose my clicker. Okay, here we go. Honey, there are arrow keys on your keyboard that will do (laughs) the same thing. But that but my but it's not poking in the right the the least technological way to do it. I know that's what I've been using all night, but it's not poking in the right place. So when my mouse moves off my advanced arrow button, then I'm dinked. Okay, here we go. So we are, Bonnie and I especially, are very, very excited that at the um, Iowa Library Association Conference in October, and I want to say it's the beginning of October, um, in Des Moines, here in Des Moines this year, um, is the speaker, one of the, I believe the Thursday morning kickoff speaker, but I could be wrong on that, is um, author Doug Griffiths, who wrote the book, 13 Ways to Kill Your Community, which if you've been around for any length of time as a board member, I know we did this one as a we trustee did. training. We um, in fact, I think the board we've done room. it twice for trustee we've, training. Yeah, we've used this in the boardroom and we've used this at least at least twice, if not three times in, in the big ideas discussion because the book you see here is out in its second edition, which led us to want to repeat the program. And if you are not familiar with this book, I highly suggest you get your hands on it before October. And as a trustee encourage you to come to ILA, um, either virtually, I think they have a virtual option, um, or in person, because there is a trustees group of ILA, um, and Steve Imming, who's here from Davenport, would be happy to talk to you about that. Um, But this is uh, a huge book to use and collaborate with your city council in how you can make your community better and what not to do um, that you might actually be doing and is and is keeping you from being better. This is a great read. It's very easy. It has so much common sense in it. It just amazes me. Um, and I, I like him. I, I'm very excited to meet him. Bonnie and I both think we should be on the dais when he speaks. We do. <laughs> but I have every intention of going up and he may be the first person I shake hands with in 18 <laughs> post COVID. <laughs> But, um, we think if Steve, Steve, um, if we, you're, we know you're in the audience, so Steve, you need to pull a few strings um, in your role as um, being on the 
Iowa Library Trustees Association, Nancy and I want to sit at the head table with this guy because we feel that we have been his manager in Iowa. We have promoted his book more than any other that we've done in our book club or in the boardroom series (laughs) at least four times. I'm a little confused who this is a commercial for now, Bonnie. I think I've lost the thread of the commercial message here. Um, Well, it is really for the book and the author. It is. It is for the book and for the author and for ILA. Of course, it's for the ILA conference. Yes. Which hopefully they can have. So that's the plan right now. It'll be at the downtown Des Moines Marriott at the beginning of October. So, yep. If they still roll with an in person event. Yes. And, you know, many, I think the, Part of the reason we like this one so much is that we heard from so many libraries after our discussions that they took this book and they shared it with their trustees and with their councils and with their chambers and had them read it and have discussions about it. They bought multiple copies of it. Many libraries bought multiple copies to share around the town. Mm -hmm. And we just feel that this book really spread its wings within the state of Iowa and the library community, which I think is huge. I, I can't think of any other book we've done that had as much of an impact as this one did. So... All right. I'm, I'm kind of curious for the stories that come out as a result yeah. of those and what those communities did. To oh, right. I would, I would like those stories, but I'll have to dig for them. Nancy, you and I'll have to talk. I think somebody needs to clue him in that we've done his book four times now. You know, he, he maybe he not, maybe he doesn't know it. He may not. All right. Well, that's commercial message number one. Here comes commercial message number two. We are looking at kind of a departure from our typical boardroom format come November. Um, We are excited about this news. We are anxious to welcome Patrick Callahan with Callahan Municipal Consultants. He is expected to join us to provide the presentation in the boardroom in November. We don't, I believe, have a specific date yet, but we've given him some target dates to choose from. Um, uh, Samantha actually um, led me to this idea because she saw a, a um, article written by Patrick Callahan in the August issue of Cityscape magazine. And the article is called 10 Habits of Effective City Councils. So he has quite a resume in terms of um, working with city governments. He is um, an author. He's a speaker. He's doing a session at the Iowa League of Cities conference next month. And by day, he is a consultant for municipal governments. So Sam, if there is something else you want to um, say about this. No, I'll just add that we're nailing down the final description and dates of his presentation, but we're looking at November 16 or 17. So um, do be watching your email for an announcement about that, as well as our final topic. He's got such a wealth of experience in the city government land. We're kind of just trying to figure out how to best leverage his time and expertise to uh, support the Iowa library community. So we'll have more announcements very soon on that. And we think it'll be a good follow-up to to tonight's program oh, um, and to, to tonight's conversation about collaboration. He's sure to have some good um, strategies to share about collaboration as well. That's our time for tonight.